Um, my name is Jia. Um, I work at Oracle and uh, I lead the Exadata development team there. And um, you know, I know for the prior two years at the PM, the Persistent Memory Summit, we had our colleagues um, came over and then gave presentations, but um, I was just busy, heads down, you know, working on the PMEM. So this year I get to come today because we actually had released the product. And I'm really, it's really oh, thank you, Andy. Yes, <laughs> been working really hard with Andy for the last four or five years with Intel. So we're really, I'm, like personally, I'm really proud of what we have accomplished, and I'm super excited to be given this opportunity to talk to all of you here about what we did with Exadata. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. I don't know how many of you here have heard of the term Exadata. If you haven't heard of the term, raise your hand. Oh, wow, okay. There are very few hands, so <laughs> maybe you didn't want to so I am actually really surprised because I thought, you know, this is more like, oh, you know, we have hardware consult consultants and, you know, all the, you know, CXL discussions and whatnot. It's like maybe not too many people know about software. So I actually put together some slides to give you guys a quick overview what, of what is an Exadata. So Exadata is an integrated, fully engineered system where it runs the database workloads. And then what we believe is that it is actually the best platform to run your Oracle database. So to accomplish that goal, we put together three things here. Number one, we get the best database um, hardware that's out there. So which means that we actually coincide with the Intel, you know, the TikTok schedule. So whenever Intel comes out with a new CPU, we release a new generation of Exadata. Along with lots of other goodies I'm gonna show you in the next um, slide. And then more importantly, since I'm a software person, I believe what, really, what we really is able to sort of um, bring to our customers is the smart system software that we have built on top of this amazing platform. And last but not the least, it's a shipping product. We are like Larry Ellison is you know Oracle CEO. As probably everybody knows here, he has called Exadata as the most successful product that Oracle has ever done. So we are like a billion dollar business. We've been I think we've been, we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary, so we have a long history. Um, and then we have the whole you know, automated management for our customers as well. Okay, so this is what an Exadata actually looks like. So I have like a full rack of Exadata there. So in the middle with those um, blue boxes are our database servers. So these are the two, Intel two socket database servers where the actual database, the Oracle database software runs on. And then, in between those, okay, the blue sandwiches in the middle, the patty, we have our internal fabric. So right now, what we have just recently released is this 100 gigabit um, RDMA over converged Ethernet, so Rocky network for internal fabric. And then at the upper and lower, the orange boxes are the storage servers that we have. So most notably on the storage side is that where um, is this where you know I'm here? Is we put persistent memory in our storage server. So for every single one of our storage server, we put 1.5 terabytes of persistent memory in there. And I'm going to tell you how we use it and why it's really cool. Okay. And this is another variant of our product. So this is an A socket server. So for the customers who prefer to deal with less database nodes, they can choose this you know, larger SMP processor model, but everything, the storage, the network, the software are exactly the same. And we talk about scalability. So it's not just like a small bunch of servers you know, form a, a cluster. Exadata is scalable. So you can start small with the eighth rack all the way to multiple racks. It's very elastically. Um, you can grow that elastically that way. Okay, so enough about Exadata. Hopefully, you know, haven't bored everybody by this point. So I like to wake everybody up because I know I'm standing between you and the next coffee break. So let's just, you know, wake up and answer a question. For all of us here, um, I think a huge audience also go attend the other summit, which is the Flash Memory Summit, right? So what happened in the last decade? What we have seen from Exadata point of view is that we really went through a flash revolution. So let's take a look at what are all the shipping models of Exadata. So as I mentioned, we've celebrated our 10 year anniversary a couple years ago. So we started out in 2008. And that's not too interesting. 
the first generation of Exadata, data where we actually started shipping with Flash is in 2009. And if everybody, if anybody remembers, you know, everybody talks about CXL in the future, NVMe. Back in 2009, there was no NVMe. So even if we had Flash, we had to live behind a very slow interface, the SCSI interface. But that did give us an opportunity to provide a very powerful OLTP story for our customers. So for those of you who are, may not be very familiar with database, databases are mostly like two type of workloads. One is called online transaction processing, OLTP. The other is analytics, like data warehousing, lots of scans. And then what the most distinguishing factors between these type of two workloads are, the I.O. patterns. So for an OLTP application, you see a lot of random IOs. It's like you go to your bank, you say, oh, I'm going to transfer some amount of money from account A to account B. So when that translates into the database, what you get is you, know, you walk down a B tree index, move down you know, through some tree, do a bunch of random IOs, and finally get to your account. So that's why Flash is very important for us because of the characteristics that Flash brings us. I know people talk about Flash being slow, but compared to disk, guess what? Flash is actually really fast. So it's a really nice storage solution for us where we actually build on top of it. We have Flash Cache, we have Flash Log to accelerate like a lot of those LTP use cases. And then let's kind of quickly move down the um, years, fast forward to I think that's 2014, end of 2014. So that is when we started shipping the first NVMe product. And as you can see, the Moore's Law kind of, you know, sort of worked out really well for us in that sense because NVMe was a brand new interface back then. And it was like almost twice as fast as SCSI. So that really allowed us to unleash the power of Flash. And then in return, we had like much higher scan rates for our analytics workload, and we had much higher, like doubling the read IOPS, the random IOs. So we really like Flash. But then what we have noticed in the recent years is that Flash seems to be plateauing. Like our read, random read IOPS is high, you know, these are in the millions. So for a full rack, you're getting, you know, six million read IOPS. Okay, that's really good. But we haven't really seen much improvement in the last few years until what happened with September last year is when we actually released a product that I was previously referring to that I was working really hard on. That was the product with persistent memory. And then with that product, we're able to actually look the jump from like a 7 million IOPS to a 16 million. Also, we are able to get to a 19 microsecond latency. And note that it's not a local PMEM access. It's actually over the wire to another computer. So how did we do that? What was the secret sauce in the latest um, product that we just released? OK, now it's the time for the, another question. Do you guys recognize this dynamic duel? Anybody have any guess? What are the two icons that put on the slide. Raise your hand, don't be shy, just shout out. PMEM, all right, the left one, I agree, it's PMEM. What about the right, right hand side? 100 gig Ethernet. 100 gig Ethernet, very good. Although, it's 100 gig Ethernet, but with a... Uh, exactly, there we go. You won the prize. So first, let's talk about persistent memory. In this case, the persistent memory, everybody knows it really well, right? This is the Intel Optane Data Center Persistent Memory Module. We use that in our product in the storage servers. The capacity, the performance, and price is, you know, nicely sandwiched between DRAM and Flash. And then we have found, as we have, you know, worked on the product, that the reads are really good. It's at memory speed. Writes are really nice because they're actually persistent. We run through, you know, loops, tests of power failures and cycles and whatnot, and then convince ourselves that, look, Intel actually really did deliver on what they have promised. They are really persistent. As long as you know how to make them persistent. Because we went through a journey of learning, it's like uh, I'm sort of echoing the prior presentations to make sure that when you write or store to a persistent memory and making sure that write is actually persistent, made into the ADR safe domain, you know, I don't say it will require a PhD, but it requires some study and work to make sure you get that right. So we don't want our customers to have to deal with all of that. We just want them to have better database performance out of box with persistent memory. So our software kind of takes care of all of that detail inside. All right, so that's number one, PMEM, 
the second piece, RDMA. So just a quick sort of refresher on what is RDMA, remote direct memory access. So how does that work? You need two computers. And one computer would be the initiator, the other computer would be the target. And then both initiator and the target will map their memory region onto a RDMA-enabled NIC card directly. Once that's done, you create a connection between those two endpoints, and you're able to do remote direct memory access without even involving the CPU or the OS of the target. So that's a technology, and uh, we actually have been using it for a very long time. In fact, we started using RDMA when Exadata was first released. So we had um, our network fabric back then was uh, InfiniBand because there was no RDMA on Ethernet. And so that was a very obvious choice for us. And we had used InfiniBand with RDMA for primarily low, uh, low latency and high throughput, you know, to harness the power of RDMA. But now, when we look at the persistent memory, what we have realized is that a lot of the databases, um, our customers are looking to cloud. What they really want is the ability to kind of run their workloads on, on their on-prem, as well as seamlessly move their applications to the cloud. And if you walk into any cloud data center, do you see InfiniBand there? Not really, right? Because it's Ethernet. Ethernet is everywhere. So for us, if you can do the same performance, 100 gigabits, both IB or Ethernet, which one would you choose? It became a no-brainer, right? For us to be able to sort of get into the cloud space, it's much better if we kind of cut over to use RDMA on the converged Ethernet, and this is what we did. So as I have told you, RDMA is great. It gives you high throughput. It gives you low latency. But why do I put these two together? What are the special chemistry that they can create when they get used together? So to answer that question, let me give you a hypothetical scenario first, which is how, do you, how would you use persistent memory in a traditional storage sort of environment? In this case, I'm talking about a storage that's connected via a network to you know, your, your database, for example, because we really wanted to have a shared storage architecture to allow us to be able to scale, as I mentioned in the prior slides. So a hop over the network is unfortunately inevitable. So you cannot optimize that out, okay? So with that in, in mind, if you do just the most simple thing, you put persistent memory into a storage server, you continue using the same I.O. protocol you use today for a database to access a block, what would you get? So instead of picking on our competitors, which I don't know if they're in this room, I'm gonna pick on myself. So I'm gonna talk about what a conventional read, meaning before PMEM showed up on Exadata, we had this amazing technology called Flash, right? So I'm gonna pick on that. Let's see how a conventional read from Flash works for Oracle database on Exadata. So on this picture, let me see if I can use a pointer. Yay. So this is a database server there. So that's where the database software runs and that's where, you know, in my prior example, the banking application, where, you know, we walk through an index tree and trying to fetch my account. So let's say my, my, the, 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 the page that contains my account information is not in the buffer cache of my database. What do I do? Well, I gotta go to storage and read it, right? So very simple. On the right hand side, I have a storage server here. So that's where the data resides. First step, the database figures out what, where, what the heck is my page, right? Where is it? So when you talk to storage, you say, okay, this is a disk I want, this is an offset I want, this is the size of the I.O. I want to perform. So what do we do inside the storage? The storage process wakes up, picks up a message, say, oh, somebody sent me a message, let me figure out how to perform the read. So first thing what we say is that to accelerate OLTP, reads are extremely important, right? Because when you look up something in an OLTP application, and if that particular block is a miss in your, in your memory cache, in your buffer cache, you got to perform an I.O. And that typically is a random I.O., random read. So random read is hugely important for OLTP. In this case, what we say is, look, we have flash. We have 25.6 terabytes of flash in each of our storage server. Let me put the hottest data on flash. In case, you know, the database has to come back to read the same hot block again and again, 
instead of having to endure this painful miss in the flash and go to disk to get that I.O., I'm going to go and serve it right from my flash cache. So it's very easy, right? Well, I say easy. It took us years to build, but you know, we figure out where on flash cache this data is. Go ahead and perform a local flash read on the storage server. I got the block back in my local memory on the storage server. I ship it back to the database. Now my job is done. Easy peasy, right? Okay, so we all agree this is how it happens. Let's take a closer look and see if we can dissect that particular flash-based database I.O. So this is the same picture except for I kind of put together some software stack that an I.O. took took, you know, kind of the I.O. pass took. First, the database software has to figure out, okay, I'm going to go read the block. So it submits a request to its local, you know, the kernel OS. That, you know, endures a contact switch. The kernel goes ahead and sends a request over the network to the storage server, which is the other computer. That, that okay, that message gets received. Another contact switch later, my storage server software gets woken up, picks up the request, issues the local read at the flash. So I'm not going to disclose what flash we're using, but let's say I'm reading an 8K block. I'm pretty comfortable to say that it's going to take less than 100 microseconds, okay? And then let's say that were the case, the read gets reaped, gets sent back to the database, went through the same context switches, and then the read is done. So my question for you guys is, does anybody have any guess how long this I.O. took? Certainly shorter than the amount of time for me to explain what happened on the I.O. <laughs> Significantly shorter than that. Any guess? Very good, a couple hundred microseconds. So, 200 microseconds. And then the additional 100 microsecond that you see, you know, see I spent 100 microseconds just on the raw flash device for the I.O. itself. So you figure, okay, there's another micro, 100 microseconds. Where did that go? Well, it went on all the contact switches and going down the I.O. stack and everything. So that's quite expensive. But if you look at the actual cost of flash I.O. taking 100 microseconds, maybe the end-to-end -end latency for a database to finish I.O. in 200 is not too bad, right? Okay, let's say I took the easier route, like I explained earlier. I'm going to just stick with the software that I've already built for the last 10 years and do the easiest thing I can. I take the flash cache code that I have already written, put it on persistent memory, make a persistent memory cache, and put my cream of the crop, you know, hottest, the hottest data into that persistent memory cache, and let it go through the same I.O. path that I just painstakingly walked through with all of you just now. What is your prediction? So to help you make the decision, we've measured to do a local 8K read to a persistent memory. It's like far below one microsecond. So since we're not into counting nanoseconds yet, we'll just say it's a one microsecond, okay? Anybody has any guess how long this PMEM IO will take? Oh, there's a hand in the back. Very good, 100 microseconds. That's exactly right. Because all the cost with the contact switches, you know, going through the wire, you know, uh, traversing between the user land software and the kernel, it's costing us that and it's not going to go away just because I replaced my flash cache with PMEM cache. And that was a huge problem for us because Andy would know this, I have a very demanding boss. When I propose this to him, say, look, I got the software, let's put in PMEM, let's ship it. He goes, no, Ja, this is the utter and complete failure. So that's not acceptable. I know, exactly, that's my argument too. But he tells me, look, over 99% of the gain from persistent memory acceleration is completely erased. How would you be able to answer to your customers? I'm like, okay, if that were the case, I'm going to apply a radical approach. So hopefully folks still remember the second piece of the puzzle. Oh, exactly, <laughs> RDMA. So what happened in this case is we actually said that, oh, this graphics look a little bit, okay, my original one looked a little better, but basically we say, look, all that fat has to go. You know, I can't afford to send a message to the other server, have the other server wake up, go process the read, send the results back to me, that's way too slow. What we do is we actually just, from the database server, issue a direct RDMA read on the PMEM cache. 
And the result that we were able to achieve is the 19 microseconds I mentioned earlier. And compared to the 200, you know, the one that I bashed about my yesterday's performance, we have a 10x improvement, which is really good. So let me tell you exactly how we did that. It's actually really hard. That's why I was like talking to him and it took us four years to get this done. Because the, the, oh, I don't know. The slide doesn't look, but it, the part you can see actually says PMEM cache. So we took the flash cache code and we say, look, I have a really good hardened stack that works really well. I stick it on the persistent memory. And I made it also RDMAable in the sense that if you are that compute server standing on the other end of the network, you have ability to query a RDMAable hash table to figure out exactly whether you have a hit or a miss. And if you have a hit, exactly where on the, PMM, on the persistent memory your cache line is. So once we get that sorted out and going with lots of concurrency controls and you know, very complex algorithm, what we're able to do is really simple. We say, look, first you go figure out it's a hit or a miss through an RDMA call. If it is a hit and you know where the address is, just go direct to the card that's you know, running on the uh, storage server and fetch that block. How easy is that? And that's where we wind up getting this 19 microsecond latency. And it's 19 because, you know, mind you, we have to do two trips, right? One to sort of figure out if it's a hit or a miss. The second one to actually fetch the data. So this is a feature that we're able to release at September last year. We call it the data accelerator. So what it really allows us to give our customer is to, if you look at their OLTP applications, a lot of their time is spent on I.O. weights because of those reads. Used to take 200 microseconds, now it takes 90 microseconds. And with that, it's a speed of a 10x, so they really like that. The second part is the high IOPS, the 16 million. So that really is a disservice to PMEM because our PMEM can do better than that. So I have to say that this is network bound. Because remember we said the database runs on one end, the storage runs on the other end of the network. That's how we can actually do a linear boundless scaling up of the storage. With that, we're um, network bound at 100 gigabits ethernet. So that's why we get 16 million IOPS and 19 microsecond latency. And we really like that. So now I'd like to talk about the second piece of OLTP workloads. So we talked about the random I.O. is really important. Let's say I went in and said, oh, I'm going to transfer you know, $100 from my account, you know, account A to account B. And I say submit. That's a time when the database needs to generate a commit redo, like a commit record, and have it persisted. Um, persistent media before the prompt can come back to me and say, look, your transaction is processed. So the log write time is extremely critical for OLTP applications because the, the application just sitting there waiting for that particular redo to be persisted. Let's take another look at the conventional log write. I'm going to bash against myself, a, a bash you know, our yesterday's implementation again. No persistent memory, we only got flash. What do we do? Very similar, we figure out where the redo is on the storage, goes ahead and send a request to the storage. Storage server wakes up, said, okay, I got a request. We have a really neat um, in innovation there I'm gonna just quickly talk about. Instead of just writing it to one place, we write to the two persistent media we have on the storage server. One is flash, the other is disk. And on our disk, we actually have a disk controller that has a non-volatile um, DRAM sort of cache sitting in front of it. So the writes to disk is actually really fast because it hits a, a non-volatile DRAM. So what happens is we write to both. Whichever one finishes first, then we act to the database, saying, hey, your redo log write is complete. The reason for that is like flash and disk, both of them have their own, you know, flash has this wear leveling, the DRAM has its own, you know, cache, me uh, you know, um, flush mechanism, that occasionally we see outlier writes. So if you issue to both of them simultaneously, you get to basically combine the two outlier pattern and eliminate you know, a double outlier. You, know, you would only get an outlier if you have a double outlier, which is extremely rare. So that's how we accelerate log writes without PMEM. And with that, the storage sends um, the log back to the database. So okay, my third question, I guess, last question for the day. If I put in PMEM as a dropping replacement, like what I did for the persistent memory cache earlier, 
depending on the read to log write size. I can't say it's always one microsecond because we know persistent memory write is a little bit slower than reads, but you know, it also hits a cache that's inside the memory, inside the DIMM. So I would say just less than 10, mic 10 microseconds in general. And uh, I'm not gonna ask another question, but okay, 100 microseconds, right? It's the same story. So that's why for log write to accelerate log writes, we cannot afford just to say, look, I'm gonna put PMEM on a storage server and use exact same model that all I did the I.O. before. So what do we do with um, RDMA log writes? So we went back to the same philosophy. We say, look, we have to cut out the context switches. We have to cut out all that fat. The only thing left is direct to wire, right? Just go to RDMA. So what we, what we did is we actually get a bunch of persistent memory um, uh, space. And then we carve those into, we call them persistent memory log buffers. And those log buffers are pre-posted to the RDMA NIC on the storage server. So when the database needs to perform an I.O., it simply just go, does the RDMA send to those persistent memory log buffers. And as soon as the RDMA lands, followed by a flushing read to make sure that the prior write has made it to the ADR safe domain, we say, look, we're done. That's it. The log write is already done. And then with that, what we're able to do is having, do I have the number here? Oh, I don't. But we have 8x acceleration in our log write latency. And just to complete the story, you can just have your redo pile up in PMEM, right? Because like I said, we only have 1.5 terabytes. Even in theory, you can go up to six terabytes, but that's not enough to hold all of your redo log writes, correct? We actually use a tiny amount of redo, um, tiny, a tiny amount of PMEM log buffer for this redo accelerator. We use less than 0.1% of the 1.5 terabytes of PMEM. The rest, 99.9%, .9%, we give it to persistent memory cache, so you can have as many blocks cached in there as possible. So the way we can afford to do that and still have a great performance is that we actually have the storage server perform the draining of the active redo from the persistent memory log in the background. So as soon as the log lands in the persistent memory buffer, the server actually gets a notification, gets a completion, because it posts the receive buffers down to the RDMA uh, enabled NIC, and then the NIC will give you a completion saying, look, one of your receive has arrived. So the storage server will wake up to that and goes ahead and put the redo and send it back to its proper place. So by that, it vacates the redo from the persistent memory and is able to post that log buffer back into the persistent memory right away. And you will ask, okay, so who said that? Dave said that? You know, if you use persistent memory without persistence, it's useless or something. So we completely agree. Because <laughs> redo logs has to be persistent, right? I just talked about that. So what happens if your storage server were to have a crash? And then powered off or whatever, your kernel panicked. What happened to all the redos that was previously written to the log buffer, but the storage server has not yet been able to kind of move it to the backing store? So to solve that problem, we simply perform a recovery. So something crashes, it kind of boots back. So when the server comes back, what we do is we say, look, I'm going to take a look at all the active redos inside my persistent memory log buffer. Remember, it's persistent, and we made sure it's persistent. So we can actually figure out what are the redos that haven't been flushed, and then we proactively move them back to its backing store. Until recovery is completed, nobody can actually come and do I.O. to the storage server. Once that's done, the, uh, the, the I.O. path is open, you're welcome to look at, you know, you're welcome to send your I.O. request to me because I have, you know, the latest and greatest results for you. So that's how we deal with a crash. And then we call this uh, feature the persistent memory commit accelerator because it really helps us with the log writes acceleration and we're able to get to 8x faster log writes and what that translates into is like lower latency for the OLTP application and a higher throughput. So we're really happy about this as well. And then to sort of conclude my talk, we put together a slide that talked about, we call it the epic journey. Because for us, it's been truly a journey. Because we started from like a, in this case, in the V1 case, 2008, 
There's no flash, only disk. It's a pure analytics play. There's no OLTP on it. With you know the next 10 years, we have a huge, you know, like a, a revolution of flash that gave us huge performance gains and whatnot. And then, you know, PMEM showed up on the horizon and took us to the next level. So we're really proud of what we have accomplished. And I'm really happy to, to share with you that the X8M has been shipping since uh, September of last year. And we actually have live, you know, real customers deploying the system and running with persistent memory with RDMA that I just talked about. So really um, thrilled with that. And uh, we got a lot of help from Intel. So I'd like to thank them for, you know, a great partnership. But at the same time, we feel like it's been a thrilling journey, just even for myself, because you know, just going through, getting to learn about persistent memory, getting to incorporate it with RDMA, arguing with my boss, and all of that is like priceless. So, really glad that I can stand here and share the story with you guys, and uh, um, hopefully, it wasn't you found it interesting and uh, enjoyable. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh. Welcome. All right, so...